Hello to everyone joining us. Um, we are just going to allow a couple minutes to um, let everyone um, enter the room. Um, as you're kind of waiting, um, I'm just showing a, a quick uh, PowerPoint here on some of the other webinars we have coming up. Hello again to everyone joining us. Um, we're gonna get started in just another minute or two. Um, as you're waiting, um, these are just some of the other um, webinars that we have coming up soon. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Hoffman. I am the director of the Autism Center at Misericordia, and we are very excited to have Jessica Gardner here with us tonight. Um, she's an occupational therapist and a graduate of Misericordia University, and she is going to be um, sharing with us tonight. Um, as the webinar is going along, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them in the chat box that's at the bottom of your screen. At the end, I'll be sure to ask Jess all your questions, and she we will be happy to answer them. All right, Jess, it's up to you. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Kristen. I will just be sharing. All right, did that pop up? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining my webinar. Um, so it's called Hands Off the iPad, Hands-On Activities from an Occupational Therapist. My name is Jessica Gardner. I'm a registered and licensed occupational therapist. So just a little bit about me. Um, I work in early intervention with children birth through three years old. A large population of the kids I see um, are either diagnosed with autism or I'm going through the process with families and those kiddos are getting that autism diagnosis. I also work in the school setting with children with autism in preschool and elementary school ages as well. Um, really, this is my soapbox of at-home activities and making things feasible for parents. Um, just working in the home and doing early intervention, I find that, you know, they don't have all the fancy equipment. They don't always have, you know, the things that we have access to if to be saw a child in a clinic. So especially with COVID-19 going on and people being at home um, and this telehealth model that we have going on right now, I just think it's so important to make activities feasible and give parents you know, the confidence to do these at home. So I know we have a mix of um, some professionals, some therapists, um, a bunch of parents with kiddos of all ages. Um, so I tried to tailor this to everyone's needs. So I hope you all find this helpful. Um, 
to some objectives for the presentation. Um, I want parents to be able to understand what makes an activity engaging. So as an OT, you know, I look at an activity and I think of, okay, this helps them use both their hands together, this works on fine motor skills, this works on coordination, et cetera. Um, so obviously as parents, I don't expect you to become an OT overnight, but it's just breaking down an activity to help you understand that a little bit more. Um, and then understanding how to make an activity fit your child's needs. So you can go on Pinterest and you can find there's, if you type in OT activities or early intervention activities for your kid of younger, you can find a plethora of activities, but it's really tailoring it to your child's specific sensory needs. Um, and we'll, I'll go through all these throughout the presentation. Um, my big goal, and this is my goal as a therapist in the home, I just love when parents feel confident incorporate these activities into your daily routine. So I want everything to be feasible and realistic and you feel like you're able to do these. Um, you can always ask me some questions at the end. Um, and then give alternatives to the iPad and strategies to decrease screen time. So by no means am I anti-screen time. This is not an anti-screen time presentation. I, um, I just feel like parents are always like, oh, they only like the iPad. I can't think of anything that makes them engaged. They only want to sit and watch you know, Mickey Mouse or Elmo. Um, so through this presentation, I'm hoping that naturally through the activities that um, I, I give you and I provide and, you know, breaking down activities, you feel more confident and it just naturally decreases screen time. Um, but I know it's a hard time right now with COVID-19 and everything going on and telehealth and school being out. So I definitely understand that this is a time where there's more screens. So what makes an activity engaging? Um, so this is really determining your child's sensory preference. I'm going to go into each one of these. Um, and I promise I'm giving a ton of activities as well. Um, so their likes and their dislikes. Um, the environment is so important, especially at home. We'll go through that as well. And then making it purposeful and meaningful to your child specifically and the safety components of that. So your child's sensory preferences. So the goal of the activity, um, is it therapeutic? Or do you wanna work on maybe your child doesn't like touching certain textures? You want to work on it therapeutically or i hate to say this but a busy activity so maybe you want to go cook dinner for 15 minutes or fold laundry and you want them to just sit and be engaged in something um that definitely depends on what activity you are picking for this depending on your child um what makes them most focused so maybe it's sitting in a fort in the living room or a bean bag chair etc so we'll talk about that when we go into environment as well um if your kiddo is a sensory speaker so there's actually a webinar i think it's next week um Chris and posted it about different sensory needs, explaining them in different activities. So I will just very generally um, go over this. But so if your child enjoys crashing into things, um, jumping, hopping, enjoys messy play, getting their hands dirty, um, we want to give them this input before the activity, during and then after to help them regulate. If your child's a sensory avoider, so they don't like their hands or their face dirty, they're cautious of swings, et cetera, et cetera, and touch, um, we want to give them tools to feel safe so they still want to engage in the activity so well i'll go through these as the presentation um so it's just picking an activity that meets your child's needs because yes you can look at an activity on pinterest and they have amazing things but it's really tailoring it to your child's specific needs so environment is so big um, um this is uh your child's space where you're doing the activity so i love like little tp tents um a ball pit a pillow in the um a pillow corner. So I have a lot of families make calm down corners in the living room. So it's just putting like two, two pillows in the corner and they can kind of just hang out and get that deep pressure and feel, feel safe there. A beanbag chair is the same thing. It's giving them that deep pressure, that comfort. Um, this is a funny one too. This is, if you have a 13 year old, this might it would be a hard one. But for our two and three year old uh, kiddos, a large laundry basket, just giving kids sometimes like that can find space and they feel so safe and just, you know, having that little area um, and then this is actually so inside the ottoman this is um one of my families actually sent me this picture is um a kiddo that i see and they got a new um furniture set and the little boy loved sitting inside the ottoman where you would put like the blankets and everything and i just thought it was the most, it was the perfect thing it was like he liked the little confined space and it was perfect for the mom because he put some bins in there it's gonna make a mess all over the floor um so it's just getting creative with that and giving child that ideal area and environment so that they can engage and they get the most out of an activity um limiting distractions so 
maybe turn the, make sure you turn the TV off. Um, if your child, I have a lot of kids that love like the light, um, especially when the living room is really light. So maybe like pulling the blinds down um, and then changing the environment. So this is really important. I know a lot of our kiddos like to get in like their habit and they, um, they love their routine. So we want them to be able to engage in this activity in a variety of environment. So maybe you do it, the sensory bin or activity in the living room, and then the next time you go and you do it in their bedroom, and then you do it outside, just getting used to being in a different environment to change it up. So they're not so stuck in that rigid pattern with it as well. So purposeful and meaningful. Also, most of the pictures in this are, are either activities that I've taken um, pictures of and I've done. So they're definitely tried and true. I've done them and they've worked. And actually, a bunch of my families were so generous and give me permission to share different activities. So the one on the left is actually one of um, the activities that we've done on an OT. Um, and it's just one of those messy play activities with a wash station. So as you can see, um, this little boy loves cars. He loves construction vehicles. So that is so meaningful to him. He loves anything cars. That's my theme each week. We do that. So um, we got flour and cocoa powder and the little toilet paper rolls. And we made the cars really messy. And then we washed them off. So it's just really making it meaningful and a purpose. I you say, like, I don't like to give kids activities that is just random. And it's like, oh, yes, it can work on their fine motor skills. Or yes, it works on their... I want them to want to engage and it be meaningful to them. So the one on the right, um, I did this activity for telehealth. We made uh, cupcakes with Play-Doh. So there's a, a point to the entire session that day. We rolled it and we put our candles in and we sang happy birthday. And there was a point. So we just want to be purposeful and meaningful and for your kid to want to engage because that's what makes them want to do the activity um that's another one of my soapboxes but i could have like 10 activities or 10 presentations um based off of these things as well um safety so a lot, a lot of the time i hear oh they put everything in their mouth like i can't do an activity i can't do that so i will give you some i can counteract that you can also ask me some questions at the end um edible play-doh i have a good recipe if you need me to send it um using whipped cream for a messy player drawing in it instead of shaving cream. So if they put it in their mouth, it's okay, it's safe. Um, the big one going around Facebook I've been seeing is the Cheerio dust um, in the blender versus sand. It's still the same sensory experience. You're still getting the same um, benefit, but it's safe if they get it in their mouth, it's okay. Um, and then here's a little recipe for edible finger paint, which is another one. You definitely want kids to be able to still engage even if it's their you know, mouthing things or they put their fingers in their mouth. Um, so if you want some more, um, please, I have my email at the end and some questions and um, I will provide some more as well. Um, so how to keep them engaged. Um, toy rotation, that's another one of my soap boxes. Um, just going through while you're at home right now because I know it's kind of crazy with everything going on and um, just having a few activities out and then rotating them. So it's always like, oh, it's something new um, and it catches their attention. And I always say less is more. So I know you can have a million of activities and they all do great things, but sometimes it's just too overwhelming to our kids and they just want a few things. So just leaving out a few toys that week, so maybe a puzzle and blocks and um, Play-Doh or something like that, and just focusing on a few things at that time. Um, presentation and how you present that. So to the right, and this is an activity I've done, is you could have, an act, have a puzzle that your child's done 50 plus times, so this car puzzle. Um, and then I changed it up and we wrapped the puzzle pieces in um, aluminum foil and saran wrap and everyone was so excited it was like they were opening a present for Christmas um, and it's great with sensory and fine motor and using our hands together um, so it's just changing how you present an activity to increase attention that way as well um, and then adding especially for our sensory seekers um, who love running around and getting that input uh, sensory and gross motor component so this is doing wheelbarrow walks every time you put a puzzle piece in or you're digging in a pasta been four pieces. Um, so I'm going to go through that as well. But I just think these are so important to help keep your child engaged and it's important to think about um, throughout your week. It's specifically for parents. So this is um, one of my favorite activities. I just actually posted this one. A recycled egg carton activity. So all you need is, it took me five minutes to make this, is um, an empty egg carton and then I just put some little holes in there with um, a knife and I colored the top and then I got colored popsicle sticks 
and we put that in. So looking at this, um, it's important. Um, so as a therapist, I look at what that target. So it's important as a parent to start. I don't think, okay, like what does this activity do and how can I use it a variety of ways? So it works on fine, fine motor skills, taking them in and out, using both hands together, um, sorting so you can get some purple and put them in a pile and get some red and put them in a pile. Um, following directions, you can say, oh, get the red one, get the blue one. And, um, color identification, self-regulation. So if one's hard to get in, it's really like them having to calm and figure out how to do that and problem solve. Um, and then trick Kicking. Maybe you can sit with them and go, oh, it's my turn. I'm going to do the purple. And then you go, you get blue. Um, so it's just looking at this really simple activity and thinking of all the ways that you can use it. Um, so if you want it to be almost a busy activity, what we were talking at the beginning, you could just leave it there and your kids could just pull them in and out versus if you wanted to be more therapeutic and work on goals, you could do following directions and sit down with them and work on these um, activity skills as well. So just looking at one activity targets and there's a variety of things that um, one simple activity can target. So this is, I think is super important, especially with our kids who love the iPad. I know a lot of the kiddos love it and they love screen time. So just some positive behavior strategies to try to transition them away from the iPad and try trying to get them to do an activity. Um, so I found this helpful with my own uh, families for telehealth, especially with everyone's world being you know, turned upside down with COVID. Um, scheduling a specific time each day to replace them. So maybe your kid is love, like 9.30 is their time. They are happy. They have the least amount of tantrums. They like to play. So maybe at 9.30 every day for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you're like, we are going to do an activity. I'm going to take one of these activities and I'm going to implement it. Um, and then this is consistent. It's part of their routine and it's predictable. So it's easy for them to then transition and they want to do it at that point. Um, using auto visual cues. So this is, you know, I'm going to set setting your phone timer for one minute. Oh, all done, iPad. Now we're going to play with, say, the sensory bin. Um, and a visual cue, too. I know a lot of families have, like, the picture schedules. Um, then giving a choice between activities. I find this really helpful for parents. So you can take a picture with your phone and um, of different activities you do, like a sensory bin or puzzles, etc. cetera, um, and then put them out at CBS and have your kids let them pick. And then it's almost, it's not you saying that you need to do this activity, it's them picking the activity. It's kind of, we, we trick uh, who's in charge in, this, in that time. And then um, pairing it with a preferred activity, so a gross motor component um, as well. So equipment at home. Um, when you go into a clinic, you got a lot, a lot of fancy um, stuff. But I, I have a peanut ball I bring in my car, and I usually find something at someone's house that we can use. So a yoga ball, I found like 50% of my family's always have a yoga ball at home does the same trick we can make it work you have a scooter board a mini sampling even couch cushions um and having them climb over the couch cushions to make an obstacle course we can make that work as well um all of these really increase attention following direction self-regulation and then participation in the activity just giving them that input and that deep pressure um so i'll explain it here so this is a nice visual um i found on this website um and i do this a lot with kids so I lay them on their belly over the ball so if you have a yoga ball you could do the same thing even if you have a large like toy ball that you're throwing you can make it work I've, I've made it work with that as well um and I know a lot of kids have this like green little the donkey or they have a horse and the unicorn I've seen that a lot now um so we can make it work with that as well so just laying them over um the ball and then you put would put where her hands are down you know a puzzle for her to complete or block um, so weight bearing through her arms really increases attention as well. Um, so it's just using these different things to help um, with the activity then increase the attention. So movement increases attention. This is another soapbox for me. Um, so for our younger kiddos, maybe you want them to push toy trucks back and forth so you can make it a race and fill the trucks up with something heavy and big rocks and they're you're going back and forth. So they're getting that movement movement and that attention before you're doing like a fine motor or like a seated activity. This is um, another one of my favorites is jumping or hopscotch on bubble wrap. I have that on the top right hand corner. Um, super easy, especially with everyone getting Amazon packages right now. Um, and this is great for coordination, gross motor, and kids love it and it gives that extra sensory element as well. 
um, burrito wrap in a blanket, so wrapping them up really tight and giving them all that heat pressure or swinging in a blanket. This is probably a little bit easier for our younger kiddos that are two or three. Um, wishes with pillows on the sofa. My kids, I see, love this. But pushing them on top and giving that deep, that deep pressure and that input to help them, you know, feel calm and ready to um, play, you know, and do a seated activity. Um, animal walks, wheelbarrow walks. These are great also um, to work on. A lot of kiddos um, I see have that hypotonia or, you know, decreased um, tone. And they need a little bit more help with their strength. So this is great. Um, walk the line with painter's tape. So I put a little example on the bottom here. Um, that's really good for like a balance beam mimic at home. So just getting painter's tape and putting it across the floor and they have to stay on the painter's tape and you can make a game out of it. Um, or making an obstacle course with the painter's tape. That's great as well. Um, balloon toss is a really good one too. You just love a balloon and you have to keep hitting it in the air. It's a good team activity as well. Um, the beach ball with different activities on it. So this is a good one I've done with older kids. Um, you get a Sharpie, love the beach ball. You get a Sharpie and you write different things. So like five jumping jacks or, you know, 10 hops or something. And then wherever you, you throw the beach ball and they catch it and wherever their thumb is or where their hand is, they have to do that activity. Um, that's a really fun one. And then I'm going to go to the next one is gross motor thing. Yeah. So this is one of my favorites, OT Jenga. So gross motor Jenga is similar to the beach ball. Um, and a lot of people have Jenga at home. So you write a movement or an activity or something gross motor that you want them to do on every few pieces as they take them out, they have to do it. Um, even if you just, if your kid, you know, didn't want to play Jenga or they didn't like this game, you could put them in even like a bowl or a bin and they could just pull them out and you read it to them. It's just gives them a different element rather than the same thing as we're tricking them. It's not like you telling them to do this. Um, wall push-ups you could put on there, jumping jacks, sit-ups, wheelbarrow walks, um, animal walks, starfish crosses like this. Um, and then also for some older kids I've seen, I've done like typing or if you want to work on handwriting with them and you they're learning their name. So you write my name's Jeff, so like J-E-S-S -S, and they have to pull the J and then they practice writing the J on the whiteboard or on the paper. Or it's just, you know, a different and fun way to incorporate that. So yoga to increase um, attention and self-regulation. So actually, when I was in graduate school um, and on one of my field works, I implemented this program um, for one of my final projects. And this is what's really made me love yoga. And I've incorporated it into, um, you know, my sessions as a therapist. So when I was there, I did a preparatory yoga program with that were five, six years old, and we just very simple, very short, eight poses, three times each. Um, and the goal of it was to increase their attention and then decrease maladaptive behavior. So tantrums, you know, hitting, fighting, etc. Um, so when I implemented this, um, how long, two and a half years ago now, um, I gave a questionnaire to all of the staff. Um, and after I did that, 100% reported that they thought the program was beneficial. Um, preparing the class for the day. So this is something you could do at home, doesn't need to be a classroom setting. Um, they thought it was feasible. And then actually, which I thought was great to get feedback, 83% um, reported that they observed a noticeable difference in their child's attention and behavior um, during tasks following this. So, um, I mean, this is an easy thing that we can implement into your daily routine at home. So that's my next slide here. This is something I love, I've made a bunch these for some of my kids, um, their yoga card. So this is just, I spelled out someone's name. I have the kids spell out their names um, with their yoga poses. So, you know, this is quick, it takes a few minutes. We hold the pose, we count to five, and that's how we start our day. Um, it's really a feasible way to get that input, follow directions to work on our self-regulation. Um, if anyone would like these, or I can, you know, send you some letters of your kid's name, please email me at, at the end. Um, I would love to send this to you. This is another one. Um, the website is below. Um, and this is Calm Down Yoga for Kids. I love this website. They have a bunch of free, you just download um, the visual and they have like positive affirmations. And it's just very simple yoga poses that you can do at home. 
they don't take super long and they you know really um, help with attention and that self-regulation component so fine motor tools um, this is a big one for how I was saying our kids who are sensory avoiders so maybe your kids does not like to touch shaving cream or they're not going near the sand and we can use little tools to help them engage with it still but they don't have to feel so pressured that they have to touch it um, also using tweezers or at home kitchen tongs uh, children's chopsticks is great for that fine motor that hand strength and just you know adding that aspect so I've had kids train and for pom-pom balls with the tongs into another container, um, ice into water, and then you watch it melt. That's a very fun one. Um, even sensory balls, and anything into the next container. Um, Q-tip, so I love this one. Um, it's small, and the child does not feel like they have to touch the shaving cream to draw the shaving cream. So they have this little thing in between them and the shaving cream. So I feel like this is great if your kiddo is an avoider and doesn't like touching things. Um, so it also, also promotes a nice like refined and functional grasp from the OT perspective um so you're you're helping your kiddo out that way um you can draw in shaving cream so you could have them draw lines or circles or if your kid's older they can write their name or just play it's it's a fun activity and I know a lot of the kids I see love this um you can also use q-tips to dot and paint or draw in the paint um it's just something different like I said before presentation you just change it up to increase their attention a little bit with little um, different things. So sensory bins, how to. There are a million sensory bins, but this is a nice, I just broke it down to be very simple. So parents at home, whatever you have in your house, I guarantee everyone can make a sensory bin right now with some of these things. Um, so ripped up construction or tissue paper. Um, this is also great to incorporate your child, get those fine motor skills and using both of their hands. Um, craft or party supplies necklaces, streamers, whatever you have in your basement, um, rice, I have oatmeal, uh, beans, pasta, water beads, just plain old water. It's anything we can use and we can make a sensory bin. Um, and then just, you know, dig through your kitchen and you can find measuring cups or spoons, um, tablespoons, plastic cups, anything like that is a great scoop. Um, another element I'd love to incorporate is um, filling water bottles with the, you know, Know, the, in, the ingredients in your sensory bin so uh, the rice or the beans and scooping it up that way um, also if you saved any plastic eggs from Easter I have a lot of kids that we put some uh, beans and some rice in there and then we put some duct tape on it and it makes a nice little uh, music shaker so my kids have been lo loving that one <laughs> so these are all bins that I have the two I made and the one I had a family made um, and they sent me so the one on the left I'm all about themes and making it purposeful. So um, that was my bug bin, and my kids love this. All those, everything in the left one, I got from the dollar store. So that bin was probably under, it was a few dollars. So it's very um, feasible that way. Um, and then you have to find the bugs and you dig. This is a nice, um, you know, more of like a busy bin. They're still getting the sensory input, but this is, I've seen so many kids that, you know, have limited attention and they love this and they'll play with this for a while. Um, also separate from the sensory bins, but in the same picture, it's, this is the save the animal game. So if you have painter's tape and you put the bugs, there's some dinosaurs. Um, and you just have your child save the animal. So they're going to take the tape off of the um, dinosaur and then put them in the bin. Just adds a little fun element. It's a good sensory activity and fine motor as well. Um, the one in the middle, I have a lot of kids love this. I, I, I've trialed all these on many children because I bring them for, um, Early intervention sessions and these are like two of my favorites um this i also got i think at the target under five dollars section and the rest was from the dollar store flowers it's just little containers black beans and flowers and you're planting the flowers so it's a functional activity um and if your kiddo doesn't follow directions to do that yet they can and just cook them and play with them and it's sensory so um and then the one on the right is a nice we love using um a lot of my activities will have empty toilet the paper paper towel rolls and you know construction vehicles and digging the dirt so you can there are so many sensory bins but i think it's so important to make it purposeful to your child whatever they like um you can make a sensory bin out of and just whatever you have at home you can make it work so this is another one 
one I love, um, this is one I've done, and I spy sensory bin. So everyone can make this, just grab whatever toys you have. It's just rice and random toys that I have. I have Mr. Potato Head eyes and a little bear from a toy in a block. And then it's, you can play an I spy, I spy with my little eyes up a green fish. And your child has to dig and find the fish. Um, it's a fun game for them to use. So how to sensory bag. Um, another one where you can use a bunch of ingredients, you can use gel or shaving cream, lotion, water beads. Definitely you want to have tape so that all the stuff does not come out the <laughs> at opening ends of the Ziploc bag. Um, you have beads, trinkets, buttons, anything at home. Um, so the one on the right is more of just a simple one. They can just kind of play with it for that sensory input. Um, I have a circle there because we were working on like drawing circles or you can practice just drawing lines or even they can practice you know writing a letter j or their name um so this is a really fun one um also i like sensory bags for kiddos who do not like touching things or they're a little they don't sensory aversive and they don't like touching textures because they don't directly need to touch the um activity whereas in a, in a sensory bin you know you're more all up in there digging and touching it um and then the one on the left is just making it a little bit more you know, where we said before, if that one's more of a busy activity, you can do both, but this is more your following direction. So red and blue paint um, buttons, and you're just using your fingers and pushing them into the red circle or the blue circle. And it's really good for that finger isolation, fine motor skills, um, and sensory play. So these are really fun. You can make it work with whatever you have in the house. Um, that's something else I love to incorporate. Another one is sensory bottles um so if you have a water bottle glitter water beads are great um oil so you get that little visual clear glue um or food coloring these are really good almost as like a calm down um i call them time ins for some of them the kiddos i see so like i was saying before that little corner you can make in your house for when you're you know your kids just feeling overwhelmed or over stimulated and it's kind of nice to just we have our our or water bottle and they made it so it's kind of, i also like incorporating them in the activity um and it's really good i have a lot of kids who love that visual sensory play so making it really bright and contrast and colors and just watching it is really nice another one that's fun is if you have a water bottle and you can do an i spy similar to my sensory bin and just put rice and some trinkets and you have to move it around and find the different things inside of that it's really fun as well So a DIY balloon stress ball, very easy. So you can just fill a balloon with whatever you have in your house. Rice, beans, the same stuff with our sensory bins, um, flour, sugar, cornstarch, and tie the end. Um, so you can use this as a stress ball and just squeezing it um, for that self-regulation. Um, you can make various sizes. So you could fill one with a lot of sugar or one that's little and it's great to discuss like, oh, this one's really big, this one's little, and just adding that component in there as well. Um, another one that's super fun is uh, if you blow some air in there and fill up the balloons, and then you could draw faces. So you can work on you know, body part identification. So, oh, here's my eyes, here's my nose, here's my mouth. Um, happy and sad and mad and making the different expressions. And then you can talk about this with your kids um, is another fun one that I like to use with the balloons. So this is a good one as well. We have animal wash. So a lot of these, I they're they're not like you need each specific thing. You can kind of make it work with whatever you have in your house. Um, so if you have animals, figurines, I did this with someone who the little girl loved trolls. So we just we made a trolls wash, <laughs> cars, anything like that. Um, water, soap, washcloth, a toothbrush, um, a sponge, a towel, whatever you have. You can make it work. Um, it's also fun if you can incorporate your kiddo, you know, painting the giraffe or having them jump in the dirt and then clean them off and washing them up. Um, it's great for pen play, um, sensory play, so they're getting the water and the paint and everything on their hands. Um, and I've actually used this for, for desensitizing. So if your kid does not like bath time or water play, this is, and they love, say they love farm animals or they love horses or something. 
It's also fun to, you know, oh, the, the horse is taking a bath. This is so fun. Oh, let's wash their hair. Let's wash their belly. Let's wash their ears. You know, so you're incorporating that. And then I've had kids that then bring that toy into the bathtub and it's fun for them. Um, so this is a good one. If your kid doesn't love water play or if you're a therapist and you work with kids who don't love that, I've had some luck with this. Um, and it's just good for fine motor skills as well. So Play-Doh. Oh, is one of my favorites. Um, we can use it a million ways. Um, I linked something for Play-Doh mats. So this is a hundred free Play-Doh mats. And I've used there's one that it's like you make spaghetti. So you're rolling the pasta and you're making the meatballs, um, making a the pizza. There's different um, play mats that you can print out. I included. Um, just use your kitchen supplies, like your your big rolling pin, or if you have cookie cutouts from Christmas, or just using that is really fun. And then it works on fine motor skills as well. Um, practicing for utensil use. So if you're working on or your kids working on a therapy or at home, you know, using a fork or spoon, uh, the kids seem to love this. We roll the Play-Doh up into little balls and then they stab them with the fork. So they're working on that. And then maybe you're pretending feeding it to the giraffe or the pretend animal. But it's really good to work on that aspect as well with Play-Doh. Um, placing a straw or spaghetti in Play-Doh, and then having your child, you know, string Cheerios, rigatoni pasta noodles, um, Fruit Loops, whatever you have, putting them on top to work on that grass, and it's something fun. Um, making the animals jump. So you're making animal prints in the Play-Doh. Um, interactive story time. So I've done this um, for telehealth if parents didn't have a book, like a video that we did, and we followed the video and we made spaghetti and meatballs to the video, or if you have like, if you give a mouse a, a cookie or one of those books and you make cookies with your Play-Doh, um, just making it interactive for that. Um, and then letter formation, I love this one as well. So say you're, if you have an older kid who's learning, you know, their name, so making the letter J and they're rolling it up and really learning how that works as well. Um, it's super fun. This is another one I love, so homemade, Scented Play-Doh, um, this is a very common recipe for Play-Doh, but you're just changing it up a little bit and adding, you know, one to two tablespoons of like a desired spice or herb or something to make it smell good. Um, this engages more of their sensory system. So there will be a webinar ne next week, like I said before, discussing sensory systems. But if your kiddo loves sensory input and they, you know, are a seeker and they are gonna love playing with the Play-Doh, this, I will really love this because it's just giving them an extra sensory component um, during it. So maybe it's like the cinnamon or the cocoa powder or something like that, or paprika. Rosemary, it just gives that scent to the um, activity and it changes it up a little bit. And I mean, this is fun to have your kids make it with you. I mean, it's a great to work on following directions or say you preload a half a cup and they just pour it in. Um, it's really just making it work to what they can do. Paint. I could have six slides on this. I love paint. I do it probably at least five times a week with some of my kids. Um, I'm just trying to go through different things that I know many parents have at home, and you can do 20 things with them that'll get you through the summer. Um, so sponge painting, if you have an extra sponge in your kitchen, cutting it up and making it so the one on the right um, square, a heart, um, a star, or something, and they're dipping it in and making the different shapes that way. Carpet squares, I know this is a funny one, but if you're at like Home Depot or Lowe's and they have like the little square samples and dipping that in, and it's just, it, you know, it's funny how it looks different and they can, you know, learn that way. Potato painting is a funny one. Um, that's really fun. So that's also down here. That's like a sweet potato and cutting it up and they need a fish, um, whatever. You can make any shape, a circle, um, dot painting like the little dot markers I love them um the partially blown up balloon so this is one I like if you have a kid who is very rough so they give you really big hugs and they squeeze and they break their pencil or they're very they're a little bit rough they don't understand how strong they are this is a good one to do with them because you partially blow up um, a balloon and then you're dipping it in the paint and they're painting it that way if they push a little bit too hard they're going to pop the balloon so it's a great one to you know keep 
than that, how much pressure they need to push onto the paper um, and how much is a little bit too much or not enough. So this is a fun one I've used. Um, just driving in toy cars and paint, so maybe do this outside now that it's getting warm out. Um, having your, the animals jump in the paint, make the footprints. Um, toilet paper roll. Well, I've done this one, telehealth kids have loved this. So just dipping the toilet paper roll in the paint and then making circles. Um, that's a really fun one. Water paint and straw art. So if you have the water paint and you mix it up and then you put it on the paper and your kid has a straw and they're blowing through the straw in, into the water and it's kind of dispersing and giving that really nice visual. Um, that's great too. Um, and it's good for or motor strength. Um, um, painting objects. So whatever you have outside, this is this is fun. You your Amazon box came and they want to paint the box and you put them outside. Um, rocks, seashells. If you're at the beach, leaves, pine cones, whatever it is. Um, that's a super fun activity and it's really simple as well. So OT with house supplies. Um, one of my favorites is bowling with red solo cups. So something you have in your house if you set them up and you have a little ball and your kid can roll that into there you can even do you know we call it like body bowling so they're running it to the cups themselves and nothing that's in sound um making drums so simple as that with pots pans canned goods uh, a bucket um hard board box and wooden spoons and you're just playing and making drums that way um i know a lot of our kiddos love music so that's a fun one to incorporate um and then the paper towel roll number and letter find that's on the bottom I've done before. So this is a great one to work on like visual scanning, um, turning and matching. So this is good for old, uh, both of these are a little bit good for older kiddos, the ones I'm about to talk, to talk about. So you can put, you know, different letters on there and they can match them. And so say your child's just learning their name to start with. So say it's Josh, you're putting J-O-S-H and you just repeat those, those letters. So you can make it a little bit easier or a little bit harder depending on your child's needs. Um, then the one of my favorites of all time, the paper plate haircut on the top. Um, this is super fun. It's great for hand strength, working on cutting, using both of our hands. Um, body part identification, so eyes, nose, mouth, you can practice them drawing it. Um, so you really just draw the eyes, the nose, mouth, that's just the fun part, but you're cutting, you're drawing a lines on the top of the paper plate and then you you can either if your kid is first learning it you would probably do the cuts on the top and then they just cut across and they're cutting um the hair off so this is great too um i know a lot of our um kiddos on the spectrum do not like haircuts and this is a sore subject so i've also used this for like haircuts um and getting used to that so we give our paper plate the haircut and it's fun and it's a good experience um also back to like the balloons, talking about emotions. So as you can see, the one's happy, the one's sad. So it's really understanding that and talking about that, um, you know, during the activity as well. That's a really fun one. This is geared a little bit towards our older kids. Um, so life skills at home. Incorporating your kids into the routine. So setting the table is a big one. Um, and you, maybe that's what they do at dinner time. That's their activity of the day. So Melissa and Doug makes a really nice little mat that has um, all the things for it. You can make it yourself, which I'm all about. You can get a large piece of construction paper and Sharpie and make the outline. Here's the cup, here's the spoon, here's the plate and where everything goes. Um, and just have your child practice doing that. Maybe the first day you just want to show them where the cup goes. So you have everything else lined up on the thing and they just have to put the cup on, you know, for plate, for um, place setting. So that's a really fun one and it teaches them that life skill that's functional that they can use um, and also helps out uh, the moms. <laughs> uh, sorting. So, um, you know, if you have a big bin of crowns and you have 300 of the blue crowns, I feel like everyone always comes out with a bin and they have way too many crowns and you're sorting the colors. Um, that's a fun one to do for some of our older kids. Hair ties, color hair ties, um, blocks, buttons, pom pom balls, popsicle sticks, fruit loops. Um, silverware, that's a good one too if you're working on setting the table. So having them do forks and spoons to start and then maybe they are able to sort that um, accurately and 
and then you do forks, spoons, and knives. Um, so that's a really good one to incorporate as well. Um, laundry. <laughs> so matching and sorting socks is great for fine motor. It's good for matching. Um, and that cognitive piece as well. So you know maybe you you make it a little bit easier. So they only have five pairs. So they just know they can put them together and you show them how to um, you know match and sort them that way. And then incorporating your kid in a simple cooking kit, which I will put next. So this is what I've done. Um, and I actually have this as a printout. So if anyone wants me to send it, I would love to. Um, so incorporating your kids in a simple uh, cooking task. And a lot of people feel sometimes overwhelmed by this, but it's making it very simple and we can go at a progression. So first, maybe you start with, we're gonna make toast. And all they have to do is put the bread in the toaster and push it down, that's it. Then we're gonna progress to, you know, we're making peanut butter toast today. Then we're gonna go to peanut butter and jelly. Then we're going to go to grilled cheese and French toast. So we're just building on those elements. Um, I find that kids love that step by step. So this is one that I have made. Um, you can do even on a whiteboard and put one, two, three. But I know a lot of our kiddos love that visual cue so they can exactly match and find exactly what they need. So, I mean, I have everything specific, other ingredients. We want everything, the bread, the uh, butter knife, and the peanut butter. So they know exactly what they need and you go through that with them. And it gives them that step by step um and exactly what to do so it can be really fun i know some people feel a little overwhelmed with that but it's a great life skill to incorporate them um and even if you're making say a smoothie or something and they're just you know helping you scoop and dump the ingredients it's fun for them um so diy with containers i am like the queen of saving every every container that we go through in my house i save it and i can figure out a way we can use it in ot and i have Gloves. All of my families I see, I think, have like five or six of these containers that I make. Um, this is one of my favorite things. Um, so if you have the Parmesan cheese container that has the three holes and you can put 15 in there. Um, the coffee creamer that opens up and has a nice little hole. I put, had families put pom pom balls. Um, food storage containers. So that's one that this is one that I've made. Um, and these are like sensory balls, pom pom balls. Um, if your kid likes, you know, like the little pretend gold coins, you can those in there so you just make a little slit or a hole and they can put them in um another one i love is like the johnson's popcorn container um the big one you can put multiple holes so maybe similar to the egg carton activity you color around some of the holes and one's red and one's blue and one's yellow and then they have to match the balls um this is something that's so funny i feel like when i pick up families for early intervention i go and for some reason the child always finds this activity and it's their favorite activity like I will come with a whole bag of toys and their favorite thing is like the coffee creamer that has balls in it because and it, it it's everyone's attention for a long time so um definitely save any of your containers and put little holes in them and slots and we can make that one work and it's fun um so outdoor activities um creating like a designated space so a blanket um a ball pit they can sit and they feel like like before I said that confined area so they don't feel overwhelmed um, maybe some, some of the kids I see don't really love like the sunlight, it's a little bit too bright, so maybe like um, a tent and you put that out there and they play in there. Um, a chalk obstacle course, this is a really fun one. So, you know, making like circles and they have to jump with the chalk and then walk the line through the chalk. Um, then you can have them draw with the chalk and use if you have a spray bottle spraying uh, with water to make it disappear, which is a fun um, sensory element and it's great for hand strength as well. Um, a scavenger hunt, super simple. You can even write like one, two, three, draw a picture on there, find a flower, find a leaf, um, find the rock, and it's a really good sensory and, you know, fine water activity as well. And then um, this is a fun one if you're <laughs> feeling up to it. Water beads in a baby pool is a very fun one and working on that scoop and jump play as well. Um, so with that, um, I gave you a lot of activities and how to change activities. So I put my section that's ways to dec decrease screen time at the end um, because I hope that adding one or two of these activities into your day would just naturally decrease your screen time. So if you pick one of these things every day, it's, go it's going to take at least 15 to 30 minutes and that automatically you replace, you know, a time that your kid is sitting with the iPad with one of these activities, it just automatically decreases your screen time. Um, I also cited here, I 
watched an awesome um, webinar and a CU course on, you know, screen time and supporting families. And, you know, she spoke about like digital free dinner. So, you know, just trying to at dinner time, we don't have, we try not to have our iPad or low tech Tuesday. So it's like one day a week, you're picking that day and you're trying to just not do as much you know, TV time that way. Okay. Um, trying like no screen time 30 minutes before bed or replacing TV time with music and dance time. Um, the yoga cards I said before, um, and then making a visual schedule with screen time in it and sticking, trying to stick to it. So you know, if you have your day out, so I know a lot of families have this when you have an iPad or um, you know a screen icon and you put you want two sections of the day for that and trying just to stick to that um, kind of helps just naturally decrease screen time as well and then I know in the digital age and our kiddos love this so just healthier screen alternatives that are um, you know a little bit more educational or beneficial um, setting a timer to transition like we spoke about before in like the behavior strategies is a really good strategy because I feel like some of our kids get so tuned in and I see a lot of tantrums when we're leaving screen time and we're transitioning so you know setting a timer and a limit for that screen time um face time that's a screen time activity but it's healthy you know you're getting that back and forth and that social interaction that way um turning tv off in the background when possible I feel like this is a simple thing but some people don't think about it like when you're home and you're just you know doing laundry or going around and you have the tv on background noise but maybe turn music on and like Disney songs on instead of that background noise with the screen um you know screen time that has actions or song plays so wheels on the bus and they're working on like imitating that movement um free dance at cosmic kids yoga I love that one they're like themed they have like frozen and unicorn theme um I'll put two links on the bottom here for those ones um and then on top of spaghetti so this is an activity I did with some of my kids for time health and we just worked on following direction and sensory and fine motor play you know going through the, the song on top of spaghetti and we made the, the spaghetti and the meatballs that way so that's my presentation um i hope that you found this beneficial and you can use you know some of these strategies for your kids um or if you're a therapist in your practice please contact me with any questions or comments or um if you want some of these resources I love to share them. Um, so here's my email. And um, I'm so happy I got to present. And thank you to Kristen and the Autism Center. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Jess. That was that was excellent. Um, we do, I have one question um, already for you, um, but to everyone else um, out there, um, if you have any questions, you can um, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'm happy to answer, um, ask them to Jess and she can answer them for you. Um, their first question is though, um, she says that her son moves from one task to another really quickly, loses interest really quickly, and she has trouble setting up activities for him to participate in for just five minutes at each time. They, she's flying through things. How can we slow him down? So this, I would say, is it sounds like he's probably a sensory seeker kid, so he probably loves running around. So. My number one tip for this is give him that gross motor and give him that heavy work. So you're, you know, pushing the toy trucks or you're doing wheelbarrow walks and you're really tiring him out and then put him in, he would probably love that designated space. So like you said, like inside the ottoman. So give him that little area, decrease distractions as much as possible. So you can't see like all the activities or you're not in a playroom where he can see everything. You're just, maybe you're in, you know, the kitchen area where there's, there's you know, less going on and you just have him in there um but i would say my number one tip for that is heavy work and gross motor so all those things the animal walk um try doing like um a freeze dance video or something like that before you have him sit down and do an activity and hopefully as he you know enjoys an activity so try the container play and then you can work up it and increase that way i hope that helps <clears throat> great um, I have another question for you. Um, this one says, my son is six years old and I feel like he's above the baby stuff, but not quite old enough for the next level. We're in that in-between stage and it's just hard to know which activities are appropriate. So this is hard because I don't specifically know your son, but um, I would 
even talk to, you know, what are they doing in school? So what, what are they doing in school? What does he like to do there? And then you can incorporate that into um, his activities at home. I have to say sensory bins and activities like that. I always say I became an OT because I love doing that stuff myself. And, you know, I'm over six years old. So I, I always feel like that. I love all this kind of activities. Um, it's hard, but maybe reach out to his teacher or his therapist and see what they're working on. And then that might give you a little bit of leeway that way. Um, and just branch out with his interests and what he likes to do. Great. Um, we have a question from an OT. So this says, I'm an OT in a school-based setting and I have a lot of involved kiddos, multiple disabilities. Sometimes I find it hard to engage my students with purposeful activities. Do you see any kids like this and have any suggestions for intervention? Yes. So at the um, autism school I work at, um, I do see kids like this. So I say, keep it simple. That's my biggest thing is we keep it simple. And I, I, you know, we work on like that simple container play or put in play um, and just, you know, grading the task to make it that way. Um, and even sensory bins are good for those types of kiddos too, to get them their attention that way. Um, but I always say like, keep it simple and, you know, try your best. Um, and it's just finding what they like. A kid, I know a lot of parents even say this or therapists, it's like, oh, they don't like anything. Like they don't like to do this. They just want the iPad. So I, I feel like it's just trying different activities and seeing what they like, especially sensory. So I would go with a sensory component there and see if that helps. Great. Um, all right, one more question, I think. Um, how can I desensitize my kid who hates it when someone, especially his mom or dad, sing or dance? So I actually, um, I've actually met a lot of kids like this. So we worked on, you can try to work on incorporating, um, maybe they listen to a YouTube video and I, does that bother them? Is it if someone else singing or is it you singing? Um, and then maybe you sing together. Maybe it's happy birthday and you just sing the beginning of it or you whisper it and you do it in different voices and you add it into pretend play. So maybe your kid loves, I don't know, like trolls and you have your tools and you pretend that they're singing it, um, just incorporating it into play. But I would definitely try um, the YouTube video and see if it's, if you even, um, YouTube, like you could find anything like um, other adults singing it um, and see if that bothers him. Um, and I would try to incorporate play that way. I hope that helps. Great. Um, okay, so um, I, thank you so much for putting up your email address. Um, I'm sure you're going to be getting some questions um, as people think about this. Um, for um, everyone who is here, thank you for joining us. We will be posting a recording of this webinar on our Facebook page um, so that you can go back through and look at all those great recipes and ideas. And um, I think that, Jess, I appreciate you helping to make everyone's uh, summertime a little bit more interesting. Yes. yes. So thank you very much. Of course, and please if, feel free to reach out to me, especially people who ask questions. I, give, I try to just give some brief things. Yep. <laughs> great. Great. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.